You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Amazon's got everything you need for your dorm. From everyday essentials and clothing to school supplies to bedding so comfortable, you'll sleep right through your roommate's new hobby. Save on all things college at Amazon. Welcome to America. The land of junk sleep, where it's bedtime, but you're double booked. Here, there's always one more deadline to meet, episode to watch, or meme to share. The world may not want you to sleep, but we do. Only the sleep experts at Mattress Firm can help you find the right bed at the right price. Unjunk your sleep, in-store or online at mattressfirm.com today. Hi everybody and welcome back to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class. With me, your partially horse host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Well, we have returned. We have returned. I still can't believe it's been a week since I was in Edinburgh. And I absolutely want to go back there again. I want to go back there again. It was so good. It was so, honestly. I literally came back, went to work, saw my kids for a day, and then went back to work. It's been full on. Uh, I usually try and organise my time a little bit better, but just the way things had fallen out this time, it's just how it was. But yeah, I would absolutely go back to Edinburgh again. It was so much fun. And there's a few more history things I'd like to do because I didn't get to do all of it because, you know, you got to save something for your next time. So, you know, if anybody uh, is looking for an incredibly niche internet micro-celebrity who challenges the colonial perception of history uh, in Edinburgh, I'd I'd love to be involved. Absolutely. (laughs) So I ended up going on a ghost tour actually when I was there and me me being me, so they asked like a question about Mort Saves and if you remember the, the Bark and Hare episode, we covered that. So the tour guide is like, does anybody know what this is? And I'm like, I know, like, top of the class, like I know, I know, I know. And I was like, me, me, pick me, pick me. I was like, Mort Saves. I was so proud of that one actually. I was like, yay, I knew a thing. Uh, I was very proud of that. (laughs) Speaking of praise, if you are a fan of this show and you want to show your appreciation for me and the stuff and the talking and the research and the things that I do, feel free to go onto Apple Podcasts and rate and review five stars. I know it takes like, um, like three minutes and it's such a hassle, but it really makes such a difference on, uh, on the business end because... It, you know, it moves me up the charts, it gets me noticed. And I actually charted in Ireland while I was away. I charted in Ireland for history, which was really fun. So that happened, that was very good. And that hasn't happened in a wee while, but it's really nice, it's really nice to be seen and heard again. But it really makes a difference and it really does help. Whether you're somebody who's been listening for a while or maybe you're new and you want to get my attention. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe? That'd be great. Just please. It really makes all the difference. You have no idea. But maybe, just maybe, you think, I want to do more. I really love Who Did What Now and I want to to really show my appreciation. Well, you can always join me over on Patreon. So patreon.com slash who did what now pod. And and you can get access to just like some bonus stuff and some fun things and so like every tier apart from keeping the lights on, you have the option to choose a topic for me to cover on the podcast. Uh, this week's topic has actually been chosen by Jamie. I am a woman of my word, and I will hit the ground running. So I thought this week's episode, straight up, straight away, uh, is chosen by one of my patrons. It's gonna be a fun one. But if you don't want to do any sort of monthly subscription or anything like that, you can always 
jump onto coffee or do a donation to PayPal or even Revolut. They are all linked and named in the description down below. Is the food. So there's a fun project in the works. It is coming. I'm it's 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 hush hush right now, but I can't wait to show you in the future. But watch this space. There is stuff happening and I'm very, very excited. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber. In fact, me. In fact, you I will. But first, we gotta get our source on. Like I said, this week's episode was chosen by one of my new patrons, Jamie, who wanted me to cover the first Queen of England in her own right. Mary Tudor, Mary the First, also known as Bloody Mary. But was she really as scary as we think? Well, I guess you'll just have to wait and find out. So, our sources are Mary Tudor, the First Queen by Linda Porter. Mary Tudor, Courageous Queen or Bloody Mary by Jane Buchanan. And Mary Tudor, England's First Queen by, by Anne Whitelock. Now, we also have our old friends History.com, HistoryExtra.co.uk and the Smithsonian.com. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? On the 18th of February 1516, at the Palace of Palencia in Greenwich, England, Mary Tudor was born to King Henry VIII and Queen Catherine, the King and Queen of England. Anyone who's been slightly aware of um, Tudor history would know that Catherine later became known as Catherine of Aragon. Now, fun fact, the reason she's called that was to demote her title. Now, Mary would now be known as like a rainbow baby. Effectively, I think we've covered this before, but um, prenatal care in Tudor England was uh, kind of fucked up, to be honest. Bit dodgy, by the way, bit dodgy. It was like, hey, eat these really, really rich foods and sit in this darkened, stuffy room for months. Like, okay, no exercise or fresh air for you, bitches. So Mary is the only child between Henry and Catherine that survives infancy. So before Mary was born, the, the four previous pregnancies, they had resulted in a stillborn daughter, two stillborn sons, and then one son, Henry the Duke of Cornwall, who only lived a couple weeks. So at this point, Henry and Catherine, they're like super into Catholicism. They're like, woo, Christianity is awesome. Like they had their own private chapel and they would pray like several times a day. It was a big thing. Three days after she's born, Mary gets baptised at the Church of the Observant Friars in Greenwich. Her godparents, um... She's got one godfather and two godmothers. So there is Lord Chancellor Thomas Wolsey, then Catherine of York, Countess of Devon, and Agnes Howard, Duchess of Norfolk. So because of her mum, Mary was raised in a very similar way. She was educated. She was more so than most women of the time. So Mary, she learns French, Spanish, Greek. She can read and write Latin. She studies music and dance. So one of the things she does is she learns to play the the virginals, which is like which is basically a type of harpsichord. Uh, so like when she's like four and a half, nearly five, uh, a French delegation comes to visit and she, you know, performs for them. I mean, how how good can a four and a half year old be on a harpsichord, really? My kid tries to like my my five year old tries to play a piano. I, I'm I'm aware of what that sounds like. I guess that a French delegate would not want to insult the king's daughter especially a king who's known for just slaughtering anyone who annoys him. So, while she's younger, Henry VIII really dotes on her. So it seems like, at the beginning, Henry really cared for Mary. But clearly, somewhere along the lines, once he realised she was his only legitimate heir, that love waned somewhat. So by the time she's nine, uh, Mary is sent to basically the border of Wales, She gets Ludlow Castle, and she gets her own court in Ludlow Castle. And a bunch of the stuff that's normally reserved for the Prince of Wales, like to the point where people actually refer to her as the Princess of Wales, even though she doesn't have the official title. So like over the next three years, she's still a regular visitor at, you know, Henry's court, but she's still mainly residing in Ludlow. Eventually, she returns like permanently 
to the home counties around 1528. Oh, for those of you who don't know, the home counties are these counties that surround London. It's not it's not an exact location. It's more of a general consideration. So effectively, Buckinghamshire, Surrey, Berkshire, Essex, Kent and Hertfordshire. And sometimes, uh, like Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire, Hampshire, Oxfordshire and Sussex are included, but it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, kind of not. So, Mary, like quite a lot of princesses, she's betrothed quite a bit. The thing about royals is, there is this whole thing about diplomatic relations and building dynasties and all that fucking nonsense. So, when she's like two, two years old, she's like pre-engaged to the Dauphin of France. And then that's like, you know, pushed to the side and she gets engaged to her cousin, the Emperor Charles V, who I think is the head of the Holy Roman Empire. And he's like 16 years older than her, which is creepy and weird. But that, again, goes by the wayside. So yeah, so Wolseley and Henry, they're working on this bloody alliance with France. And they basically put together this marriage contract that says Mary would marry either King Francis I or his second son, the Duke of Orleans. But like, they end up with an alliance anyway, so again, I gets ripped up and thrown away. And then they thought, you know, closer to home, they were trying to arrange for her to marry her cousin, James V of Scotland. Mm. But what did she look like, I hear you ask? Because, sure. So, Mary is referred to, as I, and I swear to God, she is referred to as a pretty, well-proportioned young lady with a fine complexion. Who can ask for anything further than that? So, by all accounts, she looks like a cross between her parents. She has strawberry blonde hair, pale blue eyes, and ruddy cheeks. So, the ruddy cheeks are definitely from Henry, and he's ginger. But Catherine of Aragon was also strawberry blonde, so she, she looks like them. So because Henry VIII, you know, decides to parade his white pudding all over England and probably a little bit of France as well, he's got at least one illegitimate son that we know of because he granted him titles and all this other shit. And he's got Anne Boleyn shacked up in the castle. So during this time, the marriage between Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII is a... Uh, Tumultuous at best. At this point, he's already doing his thing with Anne Boleyn. Henry, the absolute gobermouth, just trying to marry Anne Boleyn. And in order to do that, he wants to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. So, you know, in order to divorce Catherine, he has to break from the Catholic Church, so he does all that stuff. And Mary gets deemed illegitimate. Boom, boom. And to add insult to injury, because Catherine of Aragon, who is going through a fucking mental breakdown, is not allowed to see her daughter. So when Mary is 13, her mother is banished. She has been deemed illegitimate. And so when Mary's 13, she starts going through these like depressive states and she's got irregular periods and a bunch of other shit goes wrong. And like, because it's so long ago, we don't know whether this is some kind of version of PCOS or whether this situation is caused by just like puberty in medieval England or fucking stress because I definitely feel stress has, you know, some power to play in this because you're 13 years old, you're going through puberty, you've got all those hormones going on, your parents are getting divorced, but not just divorced, your father is actively campaigning for God's representative on earth to deem that you are not legitimately his. Your mother has been banished. You are not allowed to visit her or communicate with her. The entire religion, the very core of your faith that you have been raised in is being turned on its head. You know, it's just, it's it's not good. It's not easy. I mean, having a stepmom is tough at the best of times, but like, Jesus. But yeah, by by the time she's 15, Henry marries Anne Boleyn, the Archbishop of Canterbury formally declares that the marriage between Catherine and Henry is void and the marriage to Anne is valid. And the Archbishop of Canterbury formally declares that the marriage between Catherine and Henry is null and void. 
and that the marriage to Anne is valid. Henry states that he is now the supreme head of the Church of England and tells the Pope to fuck off. So, naturally, Catherine loses her title and gets demoted back to Dowager Princess of Wales, which was like her title before before she married Henry. And Mary, Mary gets declared illegitimate. So, instead of being Princess Mary, she's now known as the Lady Mary. She gets knocked out of the line of succession and her half-sister Elizabeth takes her place. Mary loses her household, all her servants... So she loses her title, her servants, her parents, her place in the line of succession, and she is forced to join the household and basically serve her half-sister. So now, on top of everything else that's happened, she is being forced to be a servant to the very person, I mean, granted, it's not the baby's fault this happened, by her replacement. Like, that's gonna suck. So, being the strong-willed, determined, fucking firecracker that she is, in a completely baller move, Mary is just like, fuck this for a game of soldiers. I'm not calling you queen, and I'm not calling her the princess. She's like, no, no. Which really pisses Henry off, because he fucking hates being defied in any way. Like, as far as he's concerned, his word is God. You do as he says, you have to agree with him all the time. So being part of Elizabeth's household is kind of like being in an open prison and like the strain of everything, Mary is just ill. So like during this time, Mary is really fucking ill and the royal physician basically says it's because of her ill treatment. So because she's treated like shit, that's why she's ill. He's basically saying, yeah, you did this. You made her sick, Henry, by the way. This is your fault. You know, in not so many words. And effectively, over the next three years, Mary and Henry just don't speak to each other. They just don't talk. Up until the point where Catherine of Aragon is on her deathbed and Mary pleads and begs to go see her mother. And Henry Fly refuses because he's a cunt. And when Catherine dies in 1536, Mary is, understandably, inconsolable. She wasn't even allowed to attend the funeral of her own mother. Frankly, I'm surprised she was as calm as she was. So yeah, later on that very year, Anne Boleyn gets executed. Henry's like, mm, done now, bye-bye. So Elizabeth, like Mary, is declared illegitimate. She she loses her place in the line of succession. And Elizabeth kind of gets the short end of the stick here because basically she's deemed double illegitimate. Boom, boom. Because... Henry marries Jane Seymour, who was a lady in waiting to Catherine of Aragon and was like, absolutely adored her. So, you know, so she tries to get Henry to make peace with Mary, but not Elizabeth. She doesn't give a fuck about Elizabeth. So Henry, you know, is convinced by Jane to make peace with his daughter. Just one of them, obviously. But naturally, he has a list of demands. First of all, she has to recognise him as the head of the Church of England and basically renounce papal authority. So effectively, she has to accept that Henry is closer to God than the fucking Pope. But okay. Not only that, she has to openly acknowledge that the marriage between her mum and dad was unlawful and that she is illegitimate. Initially, she's like, sure, I'll submit to your authority as far as God and my conscience permit. But in the end, she gets bullied into signing this fucking document, agreeing to all of Henry's bullshit demands. So she does get some of her privileges back. She's still the Lady Mary, she's still illegitimate, but she's got like a household, she gets a wee privy purse, so she's got some money coming in, and she resumes her place at court. So the next year, Jane dies after giving birth to Prince Edward the only legitimate son of Henry VIII. So, by the time Jane Seymour dies, Mary has definitely managed to curtail herself a wee bit, so she's not being as overt and opinionated, at least, you know, openly, because she is elevated to the point where she's made godmother to Edward, and 
she acts as the chief mourner at Jane Seymour's funeral. So even though she's technically illegitimate at this point, you know, she's still the king's daughter, and as such, she's still a decent match. So Duke Philip of Bavaria, he's trying to, like, get her hand in marriage, but he's Lutheran and she's like, no, no thank you, bye now. And, and here's the interesting part. So England's trying to have this alliance with the Duchy of Cleves. And they're thinking, Mary and the Duke of Cleves, they're the same age. So, they, you know, they try and work something out with them. But instead, they're like, hey, he's got two sisters. And one of whom is Anne, Anne of Cleves. And they're like, you know what? This will do instead. And so Henry marries Anne of Cleves. So now Mary's on stepmother number three, and she actually really gets on with Anne. And really, and if you look at the story of Anne of Cleves and how she survived, you can really see that Mary and Elizabeth really learned from her as a person. So, yeah, Anne and Henry, their marriage is annulled, and Henry marries Catherine Howard. Stepmother number four. So when Henry marries stepmother number four, Catherine Howard, who is younger than Mary, she's not too pleased. She doesn't like her, she finds her frivolous and stupid, and she's just not into it. So after Catherine Part Deux gets the job, it's the royal Christmas festivities, and Henry is without a wife. So Mary gets called in and has to act as the hostess, effectively, for the Christmas festivities. No marriages, no consort. Mary basically does the woman's part and acts like a hostess. But by 1543, stepmother number five, Catherine Parr, convinces Henry to bring the family together. So to reconcile properly with both of his daughters and both Mary and Elizabeth are added to the line of succession after Edward. So they've got their their spots back effectively. So Henry dies eventually. So Henry VIII dies in 1547 and is succeeded by his son, Edward. Now, Edward is still a kid. So he's got this council who basically rule the show. And Edward, no offence, uh, was a little fucking shit. So the country is basically ruled by Protestants and Mary is really, really Catholic. And her practising her own religion basically becomes illegal. And for most of Edward's reign, Mary basically stayed on her own estates and didn't attend court. There was like plans to smuggle her out of England for her own safety, but they didn't come to anything. And at Christmas of 1550, Elizabeth and Mary, they're invited to, you know, reunite with their brother, who's 13. And he publicly embarrasses her in front of everyone because she refuses to denounce Catholicism. And it gets to the point that both Mary and Edward end up sobbing in front of everybody. Like, okay. But no matter what happens throughout Edward's reign, Mary refuses to like give in to his demands. She's like, no, no thank you, I'm fine. Three years later, Edward the Sixth dies. Maybe from tuberculosis, we're not entirely sure. But being a staunch Protestant and a stubborn teenager, he really didn't want Mary to be the next queen. So he decides to contradict the act of succession and named Lady Jane Grey as his successor. So before King Edward's death is you know, made public, John Dudley secures control of the tower and the royal artillery. And so he basically has the royal artillery and all the money at his disposal. So he he feels like he's secured London and Lady Jane gets declared queen. Unfortunately for Lady Jane and Dudley, Mary gets tipped off that Edward was, you know, on his deathbed. And she fucking rushes across East Anglia. She gets to Suffolk and raises her standard and rallies the gentry and all the people to her cause. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, 
pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery+. Plus. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So basically, the area where Mary was at was full of Dudley's enemies because he'd quashed like a rebellion there, like beforehand. So she has this fucking militia and she orchestrates a fucking coup. So on the 10th of July, 1553, Lady Jane gets proclaimed queen. And on that same day, Mary's letter to the Privy Council arrives, basically with orders for her proclamation as, you know, Edward's successor. So by the 19th of July, so nine days later, Jane is deposed. The support for her has completely collapsed and her and her dad, they're imprisoned in the Tower of London. So Mary rides into London on the 3rd of August with just like a fuck ton of support. But she doesn't arrive alone. She's accompanied by Elizabeth and a procession of over 800 nobles and, and gentry. Mary Tudor led the only successful revolt against central government in 16th century England. Like, they were consistently revolting, you know. There was rebellions and revolts. They were happening all over the shop. But Mary is the only one to have succeeded. So there's a coup, because obviously Lady Jane Grey has taken the throne, and she mounts and mobilises a counter-coup, manages to elude capture, and fucking wins. Like, huzzah! She definitely took some lessons from uh, from Anne of Cleves because she didn't really... She wasn't, like, aggressively Catholic, unlike, you know, some people on the internet. She managed to secure both Catholic and Protestant support, which is no mean feat, especially in this day and age when, like, your religion mattered more than your race, ethnicity, or um, uh, the, the, the nationality. So Mary's accession to the throne changes everything when it comes to monarchy because every law every writing every act the image the expectations all of it are male everything's male dominated it's very patriarchal it just is so when she comes on the parliament has to pass the act for regal power which effectively states that queens hold as much power as their male predecessor would thus allowing the crown to be sort of genderless, you know? So Mary's coronation, she does the full regalia, the same thing the kings had before her. She goes all out. And who accompanies her to her coronation? Anne of fucking Cleves! Yes! Love Anne of Cleves here, where where, where, where Cleves stands in this house. So, uh, yup. So Mary, she's on the throne, she's got there. So she's in her late 30s at this point. She's, She's on the throne. 
she's got herself sorted, but there's one thing that she hasn't done as a ruler and that is continue the line of succession. So she is supposed to produce an heir, one way or the other. So she's like, shit, I better get married then, innit? Unfortunately, her marriage plans spark an uprising. So Mary is betrothed to Prince Philip of Spain and the Wyatt Rebellion is instigated. Basically, they're trying to overthrow Mary because they're worried that it's going to bring like another Catholic Reformation to the country. And this uprising definitely didn't have enough bicarb in it because it, it sunk. It landed flat on its face. And so a hundred people involved in this are executed, including Lady Jane Grey. Now, because effectively Lady Jane was under house arrest, they were kind of keeping her, you know, close by in the Tower of London, which used to be the official residence of the Queen, by the way. But anyway, so because her dad was involved in the uprising, they were like, fuck. So Mary had to get rid of her. And so she got her head chopped off too. So when it comes to Mary and Philip, because the way things were in England, any titles or money or land or anything that a woman owned, they became her husband's when they got married. So they were worried that, you know, Spain would then own England, effectively. So when they put together Queen Mary's Marriage Act, Philip gets styled King of England and all like official documents, gets both of their names. The Parliament comes under joint authority, um, but only under Mary's lifetime. Like if she dies, he has to bugger back off to Spain. England didn't have to support, you know, the King of Spain in any war and Philip could not act without his wife's consent. Unlike most uh, royal marriages, this was not a marriage for love, it was a political... And Philip wasn't really happy of the terms but they were like, no, it's okay. So Emperor Charles V, he has to elevate Philip to bring him up in rank for Mary. So he gives him the crown of Naples and the claim to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. So when they get married, Mary is not only Queen of England, um, uh, what was it? Something of Ireland? Something of Ireland and Queen of Naples and Queen of Jerusalem. So they get married at Winchester Cathedral on the 25th of July, 1554, two days after they first meet. Philip couldn't speak any English, so they basically speak this weird mishmash of Latin, French and Spanish. A couple months later, Mary stops menstruating. She gains weight and she has this effectively phantom pregnancy. Everyone is convinced she's pregnant. And as we've said before, Tudor um, prenatal care and things like that aren't exactly top of the range. So just in case Mary died in childbirth, the, the Parliament passes an act making Philip Regent, you know, just in case. In April of the next year, Elizabeth, who was under house arrest because they thought she was involved in the, the Wyatt affair, but she wasn't, that we know of, and she gets released because she's called to court to be a witness to the birth because they think it's going to happen soon, but um, nothing happens. And then eventually her stomach recedes again and Mary is convinced that this is her not being pregnant is God's punishment for her having tolerated heretics. So Philip leaves to command armies in, against France and Mary is really upset he's gone like so over the course of their marriage she's fallen in love with him and she's fucking heartbroken and depressed that he's gone so Elizabeth she ends up staying at court with Mary until like October because she's back in she's back in the fold and Philip is really worried that the next claimant of the English throne was Queen of Scots who was engaged to the Dauphin of France so Philip's trying to convince Elizabeth to marry his cousin. Back to, you know, ruling and shit. In the month following her accession to the throne, Mary issues a proclamation that she's not going to force any of her subjects to follow any religion. She does, however, imprison a bunch of leading Protestant churchmen. Also, in addition, furthermore, her first parliament declares her parents' marriage valid she abolishes Edward's like really ridiculous religious laws and you know church doctrine gets restored back to how it was in 1539. Now, so when Mary takes the throne, she tries to reconnect with Rome. So Mary works out this deal with Rome. They reconnect, 
Parliament repeals Henry's religious laws, the English church returns to Roman jurisdiction. There is concessions on both sides, like the confiscated monastery lands don't get returned to the church, they remain in the hands of like the new influential owners. Mary, the Pope, everybody, they approve the deal, and the Heresy Acts get revived. When these come back, about 800 rich Protestants get the fuck out of Dodge. And those who stayed, and were, you know, being very loud and very public about their beliefs, they become targets of the heresy laws. Long story short, she executes 283 people, the majority of which were burnt at the stake. So, the burning at the stake thing, it's like really, really unpopular at the time, and it kind of sparks these anti-Catholic and anti-Spanish feelings, because they're blaming the, the foreign thing. But, you know, after this, she doesn't really execute so much. Also, yes, also in addition, furthermore, Mary wasn't just the Queen of England, Naples, and Jerusalem. She was also known as the Queen of Ireland because um, of the whole Tudor conquest, which was super fun. We love a good plantation. It's not terrible for anybody. So Mary wanted to continue her father's work in gaining control of Ireland. And so started the the leashing off lay plantations effectively. Because Queen Mary, she wanted to extend English control beyond the Pale. The Pale is like um, this area of Dublin, which was basically under British rule. Anyway, she decides to um, confiscate land from the Irish and hand it over to loyal English subjects. Now, not a great idea, because the first thing she does, because she sends them to Leash and Offaly. I mean, like, nobody wants to go to Offaly. Okay, at the time, they were known as Queen's County and King's County. And um, needless to say, this did not go down well. First of all, uh, the Queen's rule for the colonisers was pretty much a disadvantage, because... They had to arm themselves, they weren't, they didn't have guards or, and they were not allowed to fraternise, employ or intermarry the Irish people, or with the Irish people. Not really a good way to set yourself off. Also, in addition, furthermore, they had to abide by English laws and English customs. The second issue with this is she didn't send over enough planters. There were not enough people to colonise the area. So the Moors and the O'Connors, the clans who had already been raiding the Pale, attacked the British planters so much that more money was actually spent by the Crown protecting the colonisers than was actually raised by them. So all in all, not a super great plan. So in 1556, the Emperor, Mary's father-in-law, he abdicates. Philip is declared King of Spain. So Philip, he's in Brussels and he's declared the King of Spain. Mary's in England and Philip is negotiating this, I want to say like wobbly truce. So basically they're organising this tentative truce uh, with the French. But the very next month, the French ambassador is like implicated in this plot against Mary. Because there's some dudes that are trying to assemble an invasion force in France and Philip wants to go to war with France, and Mary wants to go to war with France, but all her advisors are like, let's not, we really do want that trade though, because that's important, we need, we need the money. And they're like, fine, okay, whatever. But this all changes when Thomas Stafford invades England and seizes Scarborough Castle with French help, and this, the fucking shitty attempt to depose Mary. And this war starts. So this war is initiated and so due to this war with France, basically the Pope isn't too happy with England. The relationship with the papacy is really fucking strained. During this war, France takes Calais and Calais is like the last remaining sort of foothold that England had in Europe, mainland Europe. And it wasn't really helping England much. They basically had it for prestige. But when the French took it, it was a real, real blow to England. And apparently, Mary said that when I am dead and opened, you shall find Callie and Philip lying in my heart. Now, was that really said? Hims to say. Philip visits Mary in 1557. So after a visit from Philip, Mary has yet another false pregnancy. 
you know, she writes her will, she states that Philip will be the regent until, you know, the kid comes of age. And they're waiting and waiting for this baby, but again, no baby comes. And Mary has to come to terms with the fact that her half-sister is her next lawful successor, so Elizabeth. So from May 1558, Mary is really weak and ill. So ill, in fact, that she's in excruciating pain. Now, so they think it was either uterine cancer or ovarian cysts, but there seems to be a few Tudor women who have the same sort of issue. It always seems to be around that area. So while there's an influenza epidemic, the Queen is already on her deathbed. By August, she has this low fever and dropsy, which everyone is worried about, so they move her from Hampton Court to St James Palace. And in September, Mary has high fevers, headaches, periods of confusion, and she even has loss of vision. By October, it's really, really clear that this, you know, she's on her way out. So Philip receives news from England that she is so incredibly ill, and as such, he sends his personal physician over. By November, she's got a wee bit of relief, but it's still pretty bad. On the 8th of November, she agrees to name Elizabeth her successor. As she gets weaker and closer to the grave, nobles and the gentry, they start filtering out of St. James Palace and are trickling towards Hatfield, where Elizabeth is staying. And on the 17th of November, 1558, at 42 years old, Queen Mary I of England, Spain, Naples and Jerusalem dies from what we think were either ovarian cysts or uterine cancer. And so ends the story of Bloody Mary. What did we learn today? That Mary the First was a victim of the fucking patriarchy. Why do you say that, Katie? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you. So, let's put this into perspective. Mary the First, she is known as Bloody Mary. Her father, Henry the Eighth, burned, what, 81 people at the stake during his, what, nearly 40-year reign? But, you know... Granted, definitely less than 283. However, we don't have an exact number, but this is very much um, an estimate because we don't have exact numbers for massacres, really. So Henry ordered the deaths of somewhere between 57,000 and 72,000 of his own subjects, including uh, two of his wives. The very moment that crown touched his head, He executed his father's advisors because he wanted them out and his way in. And yet, he's still not called Bloody Henry. Edward VI, Mary's younger brother, he burned two radical Protestant Anabaptists at the stake and he sanctioned the suppression of the Prayer Brook Rebellion, resulting in the deaths of around five and a half thousand Catholics. And this is during his six-year reign. He, he reigned for six years, Mary reigned for five, but yet still not known as Bloody Edward. Then, of course, we have Elizabeth I, who burned five Anabaptists at the stake, executed around 800 Catholic rebels, and had 183 Catholics hanged, drawn, and quartered. And during the 16th century, Executing people was very much part of the norm. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying it happened. Monarchs all over Europe would be doing the exact same thing. So why she is known as the bloody tyrant when all these other monarchs are either just as bad or much worse? Why? Because of misogynistic propaganda. Mary was England's first queen. And if it weren't for some arsehole John Fox writing this inflammatory pamphlet, we probably wouldn't know her as Bloody Mary and, and the, you know, the burnings would probably just be a footnote in history and she would have instead been known as the first Queen Regnant of England. What have we learned today? History is often portrayed to us through a patriarchal lens that we have to smash with a hammer in order to get to the truth. That being said, recommendation time. So, I got a new book. I got a new book for my birthday. It's called The Sexual History of London. You, can, you should read it. It's fun. <laughs> uh, for listening, I have been listening to Tenfold More Wicked Presents Wicked Words. So there's this podcast called Tenfold More Wicked. 
each series is on a different vintage case. I, I do love my historical true crime. And it's, it's really funny, every case they've covered so far, I, I've known, but um, they've got this new series out called Wicked Words. And basically the host of Tenfold More Wicked, Kate Winkler, it's always a Kate, she, uh, she interviews journalists and writers about their best true crime cases. It's really fun. I enjoy it. And, and watching Hawkeye season one. So Hawkeye, the Hawkeye TV show is out and it's got a canonically deaf Clint Barton. And I'm very happy about it. I'm definitely enjoying it. You should definitely check it out if you like Marvel. It's a bit grittier. Not too gritty. It's still got that Marvel sheen on it. But it's, it's not quite the diehard of TV shows. But it's close. Don't forget if you want to talk to me. Don't forget you can follow me on all my socials. Links are in the description down below. Generally, it's who did what now pod, apart from Twitter, which is who did what now PD, because, yeah, I'd, there wasn't enough characters. And my voice is starting to go again. So I will chat to you next time. Adios, au revoir, avoir, my friends. Bye-bye.